Hey everybody, good evening. It's Doug Mitchell here with the Glacier National Park Conservancy. What a treat we have in store tonight. Uh, it's that time of year. Um, the battle between winter and spring is on. And that means that the snow plows are working hard at Glacier National Park to get the going to the sun, get the whole park open. But uh, all eyes, of course, are always on the going to the sun road. Uh, Brian Paul um, is kind of the guy who's gonna guide us, give us, pull the curtains back and let us see behind the curtains what actually goes into getting Glacier open, our topic tonight. Um, so thanks again uh, for joining us. We're gonna be using the chat for our questions. So feel free to throw questions in the chat. My amazing colleague, uh, Stacy Dubuque, um, who is our Director of Development, is going to be moderating uh, that for us. And, and um, Brian, thanks so much for uh, taking some time out of your schedule to be with us. No problem, it's good to be here. Now, now you're a local boy. Um, talk, us, talk to us a little bit about kind of your path to doing this work at Glacier. Well, my path started in, well, I grew up on the east side of the park in Browning, East Glacier and Bab, St. Mary's area. So the park's always been part of me, you know, growing up as a kid going through the park. I did a brief stint in the Navy for four and a half years. I came back and worked for the Bureau of Reclamation in BAB for eight years. And then I transferred over from the Bureau of Reclamation to the west side of the park as an equipment operator and have been working on the Sun Road since 2009. So this is my 15th opening in the park and worked my way up to road supervisor. And so I've been doing it since 2019. Well, it's, it's important work and thank you for your service, uh, both to the park and of course, to all of us and your service in, uh, in the military. So we, we appreciate you. Um, so uh, every year, this is kind of the, you know, we all get kind of this, this, this excitement that builds about being able to get back into the, into the park. Um, you know, my wife and I ski a lot in the park, so, so we, we get to do it in the winter, but I know the road is, um, is, is really an issue of great significance and we're really excited tonight to hear from you. So kind of without further ado, I know you've put together a PowerPoint. Um, we really appreciate all the work you've put into yeah. it. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to you and we're gonna get a cameo appearance from John Lucky, your colleague John Lucky as well, toward the end of the presentation. John, also thank you for, for joining us. So um, if you wanna go ahead and try and share your screen and, and load that up, we'll, um, we'll follow the leader here. And again, people use the chat, please to uh, put your questions in and, and Brian and, and John are happy to answer. Yep, and bear with me everybody. I'm a lever puller and operator, not so much a computer operator. So I'll do my nope. best to get this to work. All right, so everybody, I'm gonna to try to give you just a brief overview from basically Avalanche all the way to the top, Logan Pass and down the other side of the Sun Road. Of course, you know, they have me up here for opening the whole park. I'm just going to go over the road. My crew is also open to Medicine, Many Glacier, all the lower areas. So there's a lot more plowing than just the Sun Road, but this is the most exciting one. So starting up the road, we start seeing avalanches as early as just a half a mile up in the Red Rock area. I've seen this stack up to 40 feet before in here, especially in like 2009 time when we had record avalanches, that was 40 feet in there with tree debris and everything. So they start early. And not only snow, the West Tunnel can collect lots of ice through the winter. That makes uh, very difficult to get through, especially with tracked equipment. You know, tracks are like ice skates. You slide all over the place. So that's one of the other big tasks we have is just getting through the West Tunnel if we have ice filled up like this. So in the mornings, we start with our avalanche techs. We have a briefing at six o'clock in the morning. They come down, they start at 4.30 in the morning and start seeing all the weather maps, all the graphs, and give us a report on what that day looks like or what we're gonna expect that day. If it's gonna be overcast, if it's gonna be raining, did it freeze overnight? Because the best days working up there is when it's really cold and the snow's locked up. 
warm days or danger days up there on the road. After we do our safety briefing and everybody knows what their task gonna be for the day, what piece of equipment they're gonna run, we all load up in vehicles and go up to the equipment. We start, okay. <laughs> once we get up to our equipment, we do safety checks on the equipment. We do beacon checks, make sure everybody's beacons on. We check all the fluids, get everything warmed up. We let the avalanche techs, they usually ski up above us so they can watch the starting zones. And that's when we start, this is what we call the pioneer cut or the first cut. So the dozer goes through, we usually set up a spotter first to look up the chute. So we get, most of the time have multiple spotters on the chutes, watch for avalanches, rocks, ice fall, everything coming down. You know, we've seen ice and rocks come across over the cliffs, over top of equipment in these areas. So spotters probably have the hardest job over the operators because they stand out in the inclement weather and all day, they stand there with their head up watching. So after the first cut, we bring in the second cat and we start cutting the road down. And majority of the time, as we can, we spend as little time in these avalanche chutes as possible to mitigate the hazard of being in them. Normally it's just one piece of machinery in the chute at a time. We do the same thing with vehicles. Everybody watches for each other. After we make a pioneer cut, we start cutting everything down. We, we take special care when we're cutting down. Four foot is, nor, is our normal depth that we want to get to. We get to four feet, not only is four feet, it's the rotaries, it's the best optimal time for the rotary to go in and start cutting the snow, to blow it off. And also the big thing is we try to maintain four, four feet because we don't wanna hit the historic rock wall along the edge. So we try to keep it at four feet and we try to keep a minimum of two feet off the wall, we let that rock wall melt out every year. Because repairing that wall is very expensive, very time consuming. And after that, we bring the rotaries in if we get four feet. And then following the rotary will be a loader that's widening behind him. So up there, normally I'll have two D7 cats, I'll have an excavator that'll grab rock and debris or sometimes go through the chutes when they're too steep. And then I'll have a rotary and two loaders or one loader behind them and multiple spotters and two to three avalanche techs every day. In the flat deep areas, everybody wonders like, uh, like rim rocks is a prime example, big drift, is sometimes it gets too deep where you can't push the snow off the edge. So what we end up doing is slot pushing to the rotary. So we don't slide off the edge or we don't create a false edge. So what we'll do is we'll take the dozers and we'll actually push down to the rotary, fill in the, fill in the road again, cut it out, fill it in again and cut it back out. And in those deep areas, if you notice all the poles, we put up in excess of 200 poles a year and then take them down every spring, which we use uh, lodge pole, spindly lodge, lodge pole. So if it does break off or go over the edge, you know, it just aggregates. So once we get to the top, our biggest, our 
biggest challenge is probably the big drift. If you see where the road comes in from the east side and then Logan Pass is just up above that. Back in the day, when I first got here, uh, our own Jim Foster, chief of maintenance, used to traverse that. And he'd set up survey points and survey across the drift and leave stakes so he can find the road. Now we switched over from using dozers to do the first cut. We now use an excavator to dig across and We've done it enough times that we know there's certain natural markers in that rock face to tell us when to turn, where the holes are, because the drift develops huge holes that can suck excavators in or anything. So you have to know how to find your way around all those areas. So now we use rocks rather than put someone at risk out there with, you know, carabiners and ropes and everything trying to stay on that slope and pounding stakes. Now we pioneer across with the excavator. What the, in the past they used to use, when they did cats, it left a big high wall against the rock face so they were staying away from the, away from the holes and the cats can't get that close to the wall because of the, how steep it is. And then they would come in and use ladders and everything, drill into the snow and then use dynamite to try to blast the snow off the walls. Now with the, now that we use an excavator, we tear down the snow as we go down off the rock face. So that way, when we get to the bottom, there's not a lot of snow sticking, sticking against the rock face because we used to have to close down the road in the middle, normally in the middle of the night, call somebody, we get a call, because the snow would calve off the wall and then land on the road. So we've gotten rid of that risk by taking it down as we go down, dig down. There's a view just to show you how steep it is. That's sitting in the excavator on the first cut. After we make that first cut, we do the same as every shoot. We start bringing in cats and we start cutting down the drift, which the drift can get up to upwards of 60 feet plus in areas. So it's normally that area will take us normally a week, sometimes a week and a half. To get, just to get through that and get it down to pavement. And you're always happy when you get down to pavement and you see a yellow line and notice that you did find the road. During all that, when we start getting closer to the top, the rest of the crew, everybody thinks the once the snow's gone, they follow the dot on the Glacier website and they say, well, the road must be good to that point. It's not. One of our big, biggest tasks is just removing all the rock debris from the winter, which all of it has to be picked up, hauled off in certain areas or pushed over the, or thrown over the edge in other areas. And then it has to be all swept the entire road length. And with which rock fall is one of the biggest dangers up there. And while cleaning up the rock, we have over 500 guard logs to install. These logs weigh approximately 450 pounds a piece. They have to be craned in and we have to store them. We take them in and take them out every year because when the road was built, it was rock wall all the way. And what they found is when in the avalanche areas, early in the year or late season avalanches would come in and tear the rock wall out. So we started putting removable guard logs in there. And what that does is every, every fall, we take all these out and store them in safer areas. 
And that allows the avalanches to come through and not blow out the wall or the road. And mind you, every one of these logs have to be hand bolted in. And each log takes six bolts. So it's quite a task just to unbolt and bolt. Normally it takes a week and a half to two weeks just to install logs. And if you're not careful and you get a late spring storm like we had last year, multiple storms, this didn't happen last year. This was, a, well, 2009, I believe. We put them in too early and what happens was we get a, a big storm or a late spring storm and then slide comes in and it breaks those log rails like toothpicks and stacks up against them. And then now we have more damage to repair before we open the road. So it's a real balance between how the weather, what the weather is doing and everything before we start installing logs or before we even open the road. But it's not all bad for us up there. We get to see the wildlife come to life. You know, the sheep, we call them yellow eyes up there. They can be your friend or sometimes they don't like you and they'll kick rocks down on you when they jump up above you. And sometimes we hire some cheap labor. The grizzlies will walk along the wall and kick the snowballs off. They help us out a lot. So the big question that everybody always asks me is, I get this, you know, all the time. When is the road going to be open? That'll start in December. People will start asking that question. And a person once told me that only a fool or a newcomer would ever ask that question. The road typically opens in June. Sometimes it'll open in July. It can vary year to year, depending on weather conditions, construction, equipment failure. But our biggest factor about opening the road is weather. I'll take last year, for example. Last year, we made great time. We were, got all the way to the slopes, almost to the top. Storm comes in, pushes us two miles back down the road. The triple arches came in, I believe, six times and it kept stacking higher and higher to where the loader can barely reach for us to get through. So weather, weather is a hugest factor about opening the sun road. So until the avalanches are done, everything's cleaned up, all the logs are in, when I turn that road over to the public, which is one of my favorite things to watch when people look first get up there. I want it to be safe and I want it to be pristine for everybody that goes up there before I ever open it for anybody. So with that, I'll turn this over to John Lucky. He's the Deputy Chief of Maintenance in Glacier, my boss, and he'll go over uh, what it takes to open Logan Pass and a few other safety items. You on, John? Yep. So once once Brian's through the big drift and they're they're doing guard logs, um, we he uses a smaller excavator to dig out the walk paths of the visitor center you see here. We then have the trails crews and campground crews come up and shovel out doorways and staircases and all of that good stuff. Building crews start pulling shutters off the building. And utilities crews then roll in and start to put the bathrooms together, meeting the flushometers and all of that stuff like that. Next slide, Brian. Then we, once he gets excavators free, we walk an excavator up onto the side of Oberlin. You can see the visitor center in the distance there where the water intake comes in. So sometimes, depending on the year, you can't you can't see that pole. Sometimes we can get up there and have to to dig around in the, the snow or it'll push our GPS down the slope. 
So we have to find the pole for the intake. And just behind the back of the excavator there, you can see the uh, chlorination building where we keep filters and chlorinate the water and the 10,000 gallon water tank that's, that's buried back there. So we dig all of that stuff out. Utilities and what's roads has helped dig all of that stuff out. Uh, put the well house together with the chlorinating the filters and then uh, start to fill water slowly and get it down to the visitor center. Pretty much that operation is is done about the time that Ryan's rails get, get completed there, along with getting our radios up in the building. So we have uh, radio communications for both sides of the park for emergency response. Next slide. So with that, these are some of the little trials and tribulations that we have. This is actually a, a picture from yesterday um, in a non-avalanche zone. Uh, below the work area, uh, a random rock comes off the hill and knocks the windshield out of a vehicle and tears up a hood. So pretty much from the minute we cross the loop on, on the west side and Saeed Bend on the east side, we're in a, a full-blown hazard territory. Um, luckily for us, since 1950, we had we lost two people in 1953 to an avalanche. Since then, we've continued to move forward in, in a safer and safer manner. Um, in early 2000s, we started uh, in a cooperative agreement with the USGS on an avalanche program. You know, they supply us with avalanche forecasting and stuff like that that helps keep us uh, as safe as can be done and help us with training throughout all of this. We have had equipment in the, into the walls where we've had to pull them back, but, but pretty much we as a group look out for one another on an everyday basis. And um, when, it's, when it's too bad to be up there, we're, we're not. We pull out when we, when we have a low deck or when rocks start moving or when the avalanches start to roll, we back down the hill and, and do work at lower elevations. And that's it for me. Wow, that's incredible. Um, you know, this is, and, and maybe some uh, geography. Um, I got a, a note on, on the chat. Um, a little geography lesson about precisely where is the big drift? The drift the is just the other side of Logan Pass going east. It's basically so it's right there at the top. St. Mary. Yep, on the St. Mary side, but it's right at the top. Because I think a lot of people um, think that it's that it's on the uh, still still on the other side when they think about um, think about that. So it, it's really quite incredible to think about. And you can, I think, uh, Brian, go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Uh, you know, to think about tomorrow morning at four thirty in the morning that people are going to be up and at work um, at the work of opening the going to the sun road and, and have been at work at, as you pointed out on the other roads, right? Many glacier road is open. Um, you know, other roads yeah. are, are making progress. So this is, this is, uh, this is nearly an around the clock operation. Once it gets started with people starting at 430 in the morning and working certainly as late as it's safe um, to do so. Um, you know, it's an incredible effort by a large crew. About how many people generally on a day would you have out on the road? Well, right now I have six of us until my seasonals come on. And then we really go on the east side. I've got three and a fourth on the way, a new hire coming on on the east side. And you've so, got the east side open um, to Sun Point, is that right? Or right, yeah. or Rising Sun, right now. Rising Sun, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sun, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's incredible. So I did have one question, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Stacy because I know she's got a bunch. You talked about getting the road to four feet. What yes. kind of measure do you use to make sure you're at four feet? How do you figure that out? Well, we pack. Uh, probe rods with us that are five feet and that will check. And I've got a few dozer operators that I nickname them the surgeons because they can see the rock wall on the outside edge and judge on where they're at. Sometimes we'll go up and we'll 
we'll actually paint the snow poles at four feet as a marker and a guide to speed us along a little bit. Gotcha. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Stacy. I'm going to hand it over to you. I know you've got questions from no doubt all, all around the country. Sure. And this will actually kind of go on what you were just talking about. This is from Gail and Joel McCurry. Do you have or do you use GPS on your equipment? We've tried it. We were going to look into doing it. The problem is the geography that is on the west side is right up against the face of the cliff. The cliffs, so we can't hit enough satellites to get a good pinpoint precision. So okay. we don't we don't use GPS. We use natural markers that that seems to work. Natural markers and the guys know where to go most of the time and snow poles. There's okay. only a few areas where we really need would actually need it. Because there's rock, there's a rock cliff on your left and there's a drop off on your right. You just stay in the center of that. Okay, so what you just said there, I think has so many people thinking the same thing. This is terrifying and exciting at the same time. You know, all of your photos and everything you just shared, um, you know, are your plow drivers, your excavators, are they excited? Are they scared? You know, how do you find people to do this job? And what's the mentality up there? Oh, uh, well, you have to be a little scared to be on your toes. You know, if you're not scared, you shouldn't be up there. You won't be thinking about everything. You know, my operators, I have one operator that's been doing this for 23 years now on that road. I've got another one that's been doing it for 14 years. So I have a lot of experience operators. And when I get new operators, they'll start on a loader or they'll start as a watchman before they ever get in a piece of equipment and pioneer. Good to know. Um, you mentioned the log walls that are removed. Can you remind us again of how many are removed and installed each year? Because that was a very impressive number that I don't think most people were aware of. 500. Oh my gosh. Okay, that, that's a lot of walls. That's, it's a lot um, of them. Okay, so here's a question from Joanna. And I know I think this is one that people have been asking. Um, Congestion has been an ongoing concern. And so people who grew up or have been going to the park for years remember when the road used to open earlier, much earlier, sometimes even May. Um, is there things that are happening now to where it is opening later or was that primarily weather conditions or just that you are actually considering more safety um, protocols? Well, we have log books that go quite a ways back. We keep a daily log every spring. And the last May opening, they didn't have any late storms. They were rolling along. I mean, there just wasn't a lot of snow. So majority of it's the weather that's keeping us opening late. Okay, thank you. Has there, once again, because everyone is very much in awe of what you're talking about here, has there ever been a time that the road has been missed while clearing? Because you were talking about how narrow it is and they're standing in between poles but have you had people accidentally slip over the edge or anything like that? Uh, two supervisors ago, we had a supervisor go over the edge in the rim rocks area, which was, I mentioned the slot pushing. Well, it was deemed that he, he kept pushing out in that area and the snow's out over the, the road and he kept pushing out and then to, created a false edge and then he basically slipped down on his own spoils that he was pushing off there. The other equipment that has been pushed over the edge has been unmanned and hit by avalanches when they were parked in the wrong areas. And that would have been years ago before my time. But no, we may miss the road by a couple of feet in some of the deeper areas, which we come back with the excavator and tear it down if it's if it doesn't melt out right away. Perfect. Um, Brent wants to know where does one apply to become part of the road crew? <laughs> USAjobs.gov. There's an equipment operator job open right now for the season on the west side. Great. Um, Eric would like to know what days do they work on the road? Is it a Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday? How does that work? We used to work Tuesday through Friday, but now we work Monday through Thursday. We work four tens. 
And after 10 hour shifts, four days is about enough. The guys need a break. But we figured Monday through Thursday work better. So that way with the biking traffic, people can get on the road and enjoy it Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Perfect. Um, and Kelsey was asking, how does the team feel when a storm rolls through and pushes you back a couple of miles? It can, it, it sucks. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, especially when it starts getting towards the end of June and the guys are starting to get burnt out. I mean, when you're up there and you're pushing snow in July, you know, and you're in gators and pushing snow all day and you come down and put your shorts on and barbecue and mow your grass, it starts getting old. Yeah. Um, does every team member have the same role each day or do they rotate different roles? My wage grade 10s handle the dozers and the pioneering, my more experienced operators. And if an operator starts getting burnt out on pioneering, we'll roll them around a little bit. You know, people are welcome to take breaks if they're burnt out or if they have a close call or anything. Okay, David was asking, thank you so much for answering all these. I think people really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, David asked, I know that even after the road is open, there are rock falls overnight. How often does something like that happen? Yeah, all day, every day, all night. Through the summer, I have a pickup with the plow on it that goes back and forth across the road all day, clearing rock off the road. They come in at six and they're up on the road, knocking rock off the road, clearing ditches and everything else. So rockfall is a big thing. Eric and Tanya were wondering, does Glacier ever use artillery to set up avalanches like other places do? They've, they've tried it be in the past. The problem is when other areas that do artillery and everything, they're doing it through the season. They never let the snow lock up. So they've tried it with howitzers. They've had jets fly over trying to break the sound barrier, trying to get it down. They tried daisy bells. The problem is the snow's already locked up and frozen. So when they do that, basically they just blow a hole in the snow and nothing slides. Um, someone was asking if and this is actually a fascinating question. If there was snow, if there was no snow removal, would the road actually ever naturally become free of snow? Well, the drift is in a shaded area. The rim rocks, if you looked at the rim rocks, when you come through there and it's middle of August and you still see that there's a 20 foot snow bank on the inside of the wall, that's how much would still be on the road right there. And the drift, I don't know if it would, it may melt out the end of August, September maybe. It's, it's I don't know if it's worth the chance of trying. Okay, what is the bear hazard like while you're working? Are they frequently on or around the road while you're working? They are, they're just now starting to come out a little bit. Yep, they're around the road. The, the avalanche watchers pack uh, bear spray with them as long and everybody else, yep. Oh, I like this one. Uh, here's a personal one. Where do you go for vacation? <laughs> I normally don't go to Glacier. <laughs> I go to the forest service across the road. <laughs> okay, good answer. Okay, let's see. Um, this is a question from Jill. Would lighting the area and plowing at night instead of during the day be a safer option with the temperatures being lower and the snow being more stable? Well, I'll tell you, when we get done at two o'clock, two to three o'clock, that's when the, when everything, the sun starts radiating into the snowpack. So that's when slides start happening in the afternoons. So you'll leave, you'll come back in the morning and you'll have five or six slides that slid overnight. The other problem is at night, you can't see rocks coming down. You can't see ice coming down. You can't see any of that. So the temperatures aren't necessarily warm, are colder at night by the time the radiant stuff gets out of the snowpack and it locks back up the next day. Okay, Margaret was questioning, what happened to the road grader that was down across from Oberlin? Can't see it anymore? And what was the cause? Do you know anything about that? The what? Um, what happened to the road grader that was down across from Oberlin? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I, I, I know the story. There's also a dump truck down here someplace. The story is, yes, 
there's one down there someplace. And basically it was the brakes, the brakes failed and the guy jumped out of the truck and it went over the side. Okay. That's, that's just the story I heard. Okay. Wow. Well, you're also getting a lot of kudos just to let you know, most people, like I said, they are very much saying thank you all for so much that you do for the roads. Um, kudos, we are in awe of you. Uh, do you enjoy your job? Do you ignore the I fact that your boss job. might be, you know, in an upper square? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love my job. Okay, this yep. is actually, I mean, the questions keep coming. These are so much fun. So considering yeah, you on. are... Uh, Keep them coming, yeah. You're in the snow for many hours. Uh, do you get a nice tan or a nice sunburn with all of that sun reflecting off the snow? Yeah, you, pretty much all my operators end up with raccoon eyes by the end of the day. You don't want to be up there without sunglasses. Yeah. So, yeah, we end up with a face tan mostly. Nice. Um, do you know when spring bicycling will open? I believe the 5th. Of May, okay. May the 5th. Yeah. From and, the lodge up. Okay. And someone did send this in, so I'll answer it. Will the recording of this be available later? Yes, everyone will get this via email tomorrow, and it will be posted on YouTube. And um, from Linda, and I don't know if you'll know this off the top of your head, we're going to go back in your history a little bit. Do you recall from the time that you've been supervising what the earliest and leading opening you have had? Well, the latest opening is July 14th, and that's when they originally opened the road. The latest opening for me was July 13th, and we've hit that twice. Once in 2011 with the record snows, and last year was a late opening because of all the late storms we had. The earliest opening, I believe, was the end of May. Right. Uh, TJ was asking, when your road crews are digging down through 20 feet of snow or more, can you describe how dense the snow is at that depth? Is it essentially packed ice or do you hit sections that are really challenging to cut through it? And how do you do that? Oh, well, I'll take the, I'll take the big drift, for example. When we start getting on down it, on that one, I... It's the strangest stuff between snow and ice. We actually use D7s with rippers to break that snow pack up so we can push it over the side. And then in other areas in the chutes, if it's really hard packed and the rotary won't go through it, we actually break it up with an excavator before we take the rotary in. So yes, it gets very hard. So the D7 would be like a bulldozer type? D7 pusher? bulldozer with rippers, yeah. I with the... Yeah. Okay. With um, what some of the fun stuff we've had lately in the early mornings, have you ever had a chance to experience the northern lights up there? We have not. It's usually breaking daylight by that time. Okay. Because normally and we'll be up there by about seven o'clock, seven thirty. What has been the craziest wildlife encounter you have had up there? <laughs> Some of my least favorite would be marmots because they tend to crawl in my machines and chew all the wires up. <laughs> uh, the craziest was, yeah, a sheep knocking a rock off and off a cliff and knocking a windshield out of a pickup. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, what do you do during the summer? What kind of projects are happening in the summertime? In the summertime, we're digging utilities. We're taking care of all the gravel roads in the North Fork. We're doing rock runs. I also take care of all the vault toilets. I have drivers that pump all the vault toilets. It's a lot of gravel work, uh, road patching. This year we'll be doing some crack sailing up on the Sun Road. So it's a lot of the maintenance that we can't get done in the fall and winter. Okay, you are being amazing answering these all off the cuff. Okay, do you know or recall the earliest closing due to snowfall? Oh, I should have added one of those pictures in my, you know, I think we closed down in early October and of September. We ended up with like three feet of snow and slides in the rim rocks. We actually had to leave some rails in up there. Okay, you showed us that really impressive photo of the tunnel with ice. 
what is your technique to get through that? Very carefully, we track across it. And sometimes we've ripped it with uh, dozers or I'll have a chained up grader with rippers on it and basically start breaking the ice up. If we don't have a dozer on the snow by that time, I'll bring a grader through with rippers and it's all chained up. Okay, what is your favorite view while you're up there? All of it, above the loop. Yeah, I like all of it. Okay, this one's for both you and John. Would you bike the road during early season or do you think those people are crazy? <laughs> I see people sitting on rock, sitting where rocks are all over the place, having a sandwich sitting on a rock wall. So yeah, there's sometimes I think the bikers are crazier than I am. Okay, um, this is from Bruce, who's a 14 year shuttle driver. And I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but I'm gonna send it your way. Do you know if the restrooms will be open at Big Bend this summer? And is that going to be set up for a shuttle stop? You can go for that one, John. I'm not sure about the shuttle stop, but the bathrooms will be open. Probably not when we first open, but very soon after. Perfect. And if people don't know where they are, they find some of the most scenically located restrooms. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but once again, um, how is the Dura patch we're doing? That was actually a conservancy funded project. And one of our board members is curious. It's been working amazing. It saved us a lot of time and a lot of effort patching holes on the east side and on this side. We really still thank you guys for that. Yeah, that was a really cool, that was a really cool project. I thought that, um, you know, Jim Foster and I'm sure John, you were involved in, in that idea to put a thing on the going to the Sun Road that in kind of one unit could fill complete the digging of the hole, fill the hole, pave the hole, press it down. And um, we were really honored to be able to, we found a, a single donor, uh, the Washington Corporation, who um, Denny Washington's first job uh, when he started his own company was the paving of the Logan Pass parking lot. Nice. Uh, so we talked to him about the ability to uh, participate in Glacier in this way uh, he was all in, and so they um, they were very kind, and this was not an inexpensive piece of equipment. I think it was somewhere in the eighty thousand dollar range, if memory serves. Yep. Uh, and um, they wrote the check um, for the for that. You know, that's the for folks who might not be familiar with the conservancy. I know there's a lot of new folks uh, with us tonight, and thanks so much for doing that. You know, that's our role with Glacier National Park is we're the official philanthropic partner. So we do that two ways. We just straight up raise money um, through philanthropic giving. Uh, and also we run the bookstores uh, to the benefit of the park, which is why we're off, able to offer you a, uh, a discount coupon. And the, the net revenue from the sales of things in the visitor center uh, and online at glacier.org um, actually go right back to benefiting the park. So we're really honored to do that work. Um, and we, we'd appreciate your support. Um, we have um, so a couple of publications. This one I have uh, is, all of our funding of projects this year. This is our most recent um, annual report, which just came out this week. So also our newsletter. Um, we're gonna put in the chat um, a uh, sign-up sheet where you can sign up to get those sent to you. And, and again, if this feels like an organization that you would be willing to support, it doesn't matter if it's $5 or Denny Washington's $80,000, it all adds up. And this year um, we funded over $3 million of projects like the Dura Patcher in Glacier National Park. And yesterday at our grants meeting um, where the education director, um, interpreter director said to us, look, without you guys, we would not have an education program in Glacier National Park, right? And so it's really an honor to do this work to help pop up more than a hundred Native America Speaks uh, programs for visitors to experience in the park to work on Half the park happens at night and the new scientific telescope that donors funded at St. Mary's. So there's a lot going on. Love to have you learn more um, and support us if you can. So um, thanks so much. And Stacey, I'll hand it back to you. Sure. I just have a couple more. And I do want to let you know, we did get a response about the shuttle stops. They are remaining the same as last year. So hopefully that'll answer that question. Um, how has the snowfall been this year? What are you seeing up there? 
It was lower down below. And now that we're through Haystack and we're through the Alps and we're just on a cusp of hitting Big Bend, uh, the snowpack's starting to get a little bit more normal. Of course, the snowpack's a little lower than last year. So fingers crossed, no late storms. Okay, Jordan was wondering, does your crew plow the North Fork Road to Bowman and what challenges does that provide being a very rough and narrow dirt road? No, we just, we don't plow, plow up there. That just naturally melts out up there. Great. Is there any coordination between the road crews and the workers getting Granite Park or the chalets open to help in, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, getting Granite Park to help? Uh, not a lot. We just uh, get up to the loop as quick as we can so they can get in there and start packing materials back. Great. I think that we've, you've, we've burned through a lot of questions. You're amazing answering all of those. And like I said, we have continued to get um, comments saying you all are rock stars. Thank you. Um, oh, and I do want to add this one. TJ commented, amazing work on the roads. Thank you. In your downtime, can you and your crew come to Rhode Island and maintain our roads here with such meticulous care? <laughs> <laughs> so you definitely have a fan club. Good deal. So it wouldn't be a glacier conversation, and I did warn uh, Mr. Lucky and uh, Mr. Paul that uh, they would be victims in our speed rounds. Um, but <laughs> what I didn't do is warn the rest of you that we're going to use some Zoom technology, and um, and everyone is going to participate in the Zoom round. And then Mr. Lucky and Mr. Paul will tell us the correct answer uh, in their view. Um, and so, uh, Andrew, if you want to launch the first poll question, so it's going to be a poll and the speed round, number one, first one is what's your favorite direction to drive the road? So you get one choice and one choice only. Second question is what's your favorite time to drive to going to Sun Road, sunrise or sunset? And third, this is a Mitchell family tradition. What's your favorite swimming location, usually post hike for us, along the going to the road, Sun Road, Lake McDonald or St. Mary. Okay, so take a minute, think about those, and I will ask John and, and Brian. Okay, Brian and John, favorite direction to drive the road, St. Mary to West Glacier, West, West Glacier to St. Mary. Brian? West to east for me. John? Dave, you have to be on the outside to see better. Yep. Wow, that's okay. Very good. So that apparently, I now I will take the I'm going to take the underbitter view on that. I I really like coming down the pass. I don't know what it is, but again, I'm always the driver, so maybe that's helpful. But okay, favorite time to drive going to Sun Road? You prefer sunrise or sunset, Mr. Lucky? You get to go first this time. Got to do sunset on that. Sunset. Okay, sunset. That's handy. Now better east to west. I'm just saying, but okay. Um, Brian? I'd have to say sunset also. It quiets down and the animals are starting to come out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I think as I talk to people about vehicle reservations, that's one of the, I love to go to Logan Pass in the evening because to your point, Brian, you get to see animals, uh, parking's easy. So sunset at Logan Pass is um, a, a great outing in my view. Okay, favorite swimming location along the going to the Sun Road? Brian? This can be aspirational. It doesn't have to be in, you know, personal experience. Yeah, it'd have to be Lake McDonald. St. Mary's just too cold. Yeah, I agree. St. Mary's is really cold. <laughs> I, I, I find the it, beach, it's cold. Yeah, the beach in front of Cabin 12 at Lake McDonald. Okay, so let's see what uh, let's see what the public says. The public agrees um, with the correct answer from our two experts, west to east. Uh, 67 to 33, so pretty strong uh, veto-proof majority on that one. Uh, uh, sunset did, did, did eke out, um, no, it's a pretty big victory, I guess, over sunrise. Uh, a lot of people enjoying uh, the sunset over the, over the sunrise. And then swimming location, I'm thinking this is a big beating. Do you have the result on that, Andrew? Yes, I don't know why it, it's not showing up, but it is 69% uh, Lake McDonald to 31% St. Mary. Okay, all right. Well, that 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 makes some sense. Okay, well, that's that's fun. I like the I like the uh, Zoom Zoom poll uh, speed round. Thanks for for playing our game. And and I don't know, Stacy, if you had any other 
um, questions. I had a couple of things I might just bring up, but I, I want to make sure we get questions from um, all of our participants. Um, I am scrolling through really quickly. One I did not throw at you, um, and I don't know if you'll know this, but do you know the lifespan of the logs? You know, how long do those, do you know about how many seasons those last? Oh, how long have they been in? They've been in since 2009, 2008, I believe majority of them. And the lifespan has been really good on them. The, the only bad thing on them is mostly taking the bolts in and out. We need to take them apart and rehab them here and there. Um, as long as we've been, we've been keeping them oiled and everything. So they've been holding out pretty well. Great. So this one, um, let's see, since 2005 was the last May opening. Since then, the Sun Road has been opening a little bit later, June, early July. And as you mentioned, that is weather contingent. Are you seeing that as a sign that snowpack is increasing and overall good news for the lifespan of the glaciers? Or do you have any thoughts on that? I've been just noticing a lot more late storms. More than anything, it's almost... Personally, I, it feels like the weather's shifting. What, what I would add to that too is, is, is when we get a lot of rain late fall, um, sometimes into the winter, in like 2006, we had these issues where we had a lot of uh, rock underneath the snow, which hinders our operation, cleaning that off because the rotaries can't blow the snow then. It's a lot of extra motor work. And we had that last year also. Yeah. I believe that is the last of the questions that have been sent my way. Thank you so much for answering all of those. Well, it's a, it's such a treat. And I just, um, so the photo that I chose, and, and thank you, Andrew Smith, for helping me with this. The photo I chose my background is one from 1925 from the construction of the Going to Sun Road. And so I kind of as a, as a parting shot a little bit um, before we go, Brian and, and John, as you work on the road, um, and you've done it for years. Um, what, when you think about, gee, I wish when they had designed this road, they would, uh, how do you complete that sentence? Man, that's a hard one because they did such a good job with it. I wish they could have made it a little bit wider as our cars get wider, the road stays the same width. We pick up a lot of mirrors every year up there every day. Including a few of ours, because <laughs> um, I, I think would we address, all... oh, go ahead. Go ahead, John. I, I would address parking a little different. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So, and I think there was an alternative road, right? That the there was some controversy because the professional architect for the Department of Interior had a cut had a um, a uh, kind of more logging type road coming straighter up the valley. And kind of a young upstart came up with this more sweeping idea. So there was some controversy involved in that as well, right? Right. He was actually going to come up the other side of the valley and make a straight shot up. And then they decided to go to the other side and create the loop and come up the rocky side. Yeah. Which if you see all the avalanches on the other side, they pick the right side. Because we'll wow. watch them all day. Next year will be, um, so Roosevelt came and, and kind of officially opened the road uh, in 1934 via the, one of his fireside chats uh, at, um, at Two Medicine uh, later that evening. And, and that will be the anniversary, uh, the 90th anniversary of that next year. And, and we'll probably be doing some work with the park to help celebrate that. But I really want to celebrate you guys. I mean, I think that sometimes when you turn to Hollywood, you get an idea of what genius and what heroes look like. I think we've seen them tonight, right? This, this work doesn't happen without an incredible amount of, of gumption, mathematics, science, stick to thought, um, and courage. And, um, and, you, and you do it quietly um, and in the background, and sometimes with people bugging you, uh, at Christmas time, asking you, Brian, right when's that road going to open? So thank you for this service and thank you for sharing um, that dedication because this is, as we saw by the pictures, 
this is incredibly hard work. I mean, I don't want to take 500 logs with six bolts on each end. I mean, I can do math. It's too many. Um, and uh, in, in harsh conditions, the rocks might be coming down on me. So thank you. And, and I will say the pristine part, uh, we all see it, that when we drive on that road, it is one of the most beautiful places in America. And that gift does not come to us without cost. And you guys help pay that cost. So thank you for, for your service. Um, and thanks for being with us tonight. This was an incredible evening as I knew it would be. Um, I appreciate the people from all around the country who, who have joined us as well. Um, our next kind of digital event, and we're actually gonna do it um, uh, next month with Michael Punk. It's our, it's our Glacier Book Club. If you're not familiar, we do six bucks, books a year, Glacier related. And then we, the author comes and joins us and Michael Punk, who is of course the author of The Revenant, is gonna come talk about his book, Last Stand, George Bird Grinnell the saving of the bison and the, the birth of the new American West uh, in May. So that's again, online at glacier.org. Brian, John, thanks so much for everything. Um, and we'll look forward to uh, literally seeing you on the other side. That's good, good night, thank everybody. you. Thank you.